The sea. Many of us have a deep longing to be by the water, perhaps more so than ever during the pandemic. With its waves that roll up onto and away from the shore, the sea appears to be both timeless and highly rhythmic. Sand seems to be in endless supply here. But in fact, the world is running out of sand. Storms are battering shores, coastlines are crumbling and collapsing, and these processes are being accelerated by climate change. How can we save what appears so plentiful? This road leads to one of Germany's most beautiful beaches, Vesterland Beach, on the North Sea island of Zunt. Greg Barber was in charge here for almost 45 years. He has a deep love for this landscape, yet he knows just how fragile Zunt has become. Morning. Morning. Greg Barber was born in the US. He's traveled far and wide, but Zunt convinced him to stay. Perfect. He wanted to savor this view every day. So Barber decided to emigrate to Zult. To this day, he finds the island's long, sandy beaches captivating. I've been to Hawaii and California, and the beaches there are also beautiful. But to me, this here is unique. It made a big impression. I was already in love with a woman, and then very soon afterwards fell for this island. <laughs> Vesterland Beach. What looks like untouched nature is actually partly man-made. Each year, from mid-April to October, Sand is pumped 24-7 onto the west coast of the island. A ship dredges sand from the seabed, and this is then brought on shore through a 1,200-meter-long pipeline. Bulldozers and diggers transform the sand piles into a beach, ready for holidaymakers. It's an entertaining sight for passers-by. But for taxpayers, it's expensive. In this year alone, replacing sand in Zult cost almost 14 million euros. The North Sea Island's beaches have been nourished with sand since the 1970s. It's a never-ending tug of war between the sea and the islanders. The measure has often come under fire because of its cost but it also has ecological consequences, which environmentalists say have been largely ignored up to now. It's a grave intervention into the sea. Where the sand is removed, an area as big as a football field of seabed, 10 meters deep, is permanently damaged. The entire time the sand is being dredged up, it's loud. It also makes the water cloudy and causes sediment. If there are hazardous substances deep down, they're brought to the surface again. But the gravest problem is that everything living in this habitat dies. The island Zult lives off tourism and welcomes more than 700,000 visitors each year. Many are extremely wealthy. Zult has been called the Martha's Vineyard of Germany. Houses like these can cost double-digit millions. Without its beaches, Zult would probably be less attractive for tourists. But they secure the island's future in another way besides economics. Without the beach replenishment, Zult would lose up to four meters of shore per year, posing a danger to the island. But is nature far offshore being destroyed to retain these beaches? Sand is not just a cause for heated debate in Zult.
A short flight away lies the East Frisian island of Vangaroga. With an area of less than eight square kilometers, Vangaroga is situated in the Lower Saxon Wadden Sea National Park. The beach here doesn't always look this idyllic. Storms like this one in autumn 2018 are becoming more frequent here. A storm surge can almost completely wash away a sand beach within hours. And extreme weather is becoming more frequent because of climate change. It's a problem many communities on Germany's coastline face. Vangaroga also largely lives from tourism, and the island is struggling to cope. On Vangaroga's beaches, Mayor Marcel Fangor can literally watch sand being blown away. Fangor says that without sand being regularly trucked onto this beach, it would no longer exist. The situation poses a significant problem. How much sand would you say you lose each year? Along a one-kilometer stretch of beach, we lose between 40 and 80,000 cubic meters of sand each year. That means a 50-meter-wide strip is torn away. Every year? It depends a bit on the storm tides. This year we were lucky, but in previous years the entire shore protection was laid bare, and that's not so good for us. How much does it cost to restore the beach and the sand? In the past few years, between 250 and 300,000 euros. Unlike Zult, Vangaroga has to largely finance its sand replacement itself. The reason being that retaining the beach here isn't classified as coastal protection, but as a measure designed to preserve tourism. Every year, the sea washes the beach here away. Every year, Vangaroga pays to build it up again. It's a Sisyphean task. The mayor would like to try an alternative approach. He wants to use sand-filled tubes to break the strongest waves. We'd like to place a 100-meter-long sand tube here that's about two meters high and six meters wide. The sand tube would serve to reduce the force of the waves. Bangor plans to commission a scientific study to find out whether such a barrier would actually help, as effective measures are desperately needed. Storms here used to be less problematic, but these days Vangaroga is becoming ever more vulnerable. The beach used to be 80 or 90 meters wide, so it wasn't a problem if a winter storm washed a bit away. You could still put out the beach chairs after. Now the situation has changed, and we need to find alternatives. The tube would be one alternative. The question of who should be responsible for beach protection is discussed all along Germany's coastlines, as well as the important question of who should pay for it. Germany's coastal protection and restoration already costs millions of euros per year. That's why it's imperative to find out what the most effective method is. We headed back to the island of Zult, one of the worst affected in terms of sand loss, to see an era drawing to a close. Here, heavy posts made from steel and concrete are being removed. For decades, they stood in the sea. These hydraulic structures, called coastal groins, were regarded as the best way of protecting the west coast of the island. Now it turns out that they were useless, says coastal protection officer Wolfgang Siegfried. We have always had sand loss from Zult. We calculated that on average we've lost a million cubic meters a year. And we have records from 1870 to today that show that we've lost an average of one meter of land each year, even though the coastal groins were here. It's always easy to be wise in hindsight, but would you deploy the groins again on Zult? I would say no. On the west coast, we're banking only on beach nourishment. Replacing sand on the beach with sand taken from the sea is classed as a soft coastal protection measure. To find out how soft they really are, we traveled to the north of Zult. Over this? Researchers from the Alfred Wegener Institute, the Helmholtz Center for Polar and Marine Research, 
are here to examine what the seabed looks like in places where sand is regularly removed. Environmentalists fear this method has significant ecological impacts. Reporter Tobias Lickis boarded the Maya II to find out to what extent these fears are justified. Sand has been pumped from the seabed off of Zult onto its beaches since the early 1970s. Scientific monitoring, however, only began in 2016. This project is funded by the German Ministry of Education and Research. The geologists are measuring the holes created on the seabed and tracking how these change. The process leaves deep holes on the seabed that can be several hundred square meters. We want to find out what happens with these holes. Do they remain or do they fill up? And if so, do they fill up quickly? Do they last for 10 years or 100 years? Or does sand extraction lead to long-term changes in the habitat? And what exactly do you do down there? In terms of methods, we have devices that map the seabed. It's a banal fact, but we cannot see underwater, and we cannot use satellites to see down there. So we have various tools to get over that problem. One of them is a sonar device, a so-called side-scan sonar, which emits signals and measures their acoustic reflection. That creates patterns which, very accurately, reflect the seabed's surface structure and provide us with a map. This is what a side-scan sonar looks like. With it, the researchers can indirectly photograph the surface of the seabed. They have been creating these maps using acoustic reflection for more than three years. The method creates a detailed underwater map, which records every change on the bottom of the sea over time. We've discovered that at the sand mining points off Vesterland, the traces of the first operation are still visible. There are still small hollows on the seabed. Plus data from the site scan sonar shows that there is a transition from sandy substrates or habitats to more silt-dominated habitats at the excavation points. So the points where the sand has been removed for decades are exhausted and can no longer be used? Exactly. The material is no longer suitable. There is no more sand there. So a new place has to be found for sand extraction. The researchers suspect that silt, rather than valuable sand, has settled in the subterranean removal points. And indeed, the probes show that even the oldest removal points only contain silt. To find out what this means for underwater flora and fauna, we headed to Hanover. Stefan Schimmels is the head of the Stencil Project, which the geologists on board Maya 2 are part of. Here in the wave tunnel, Schimmels is studying what impact the sand removal has, amongst other things, on seabed marine plants and creatures. It is not just sand that is extracted during sand removal, but everything that lives on the sandy sea floor. These creatures are initially gone. And the question was, does the system recover, or can it even recover? We found that in the sediment that we analyzed, there were significantly higher rates of death among fish larvae than was the case in untouched sediment. The scientists were thus able to prove that fish larvae developed less well in excavation points than in areas where no sand had been removed. It was surprising to discover that the seabed recovers a lot more slowly than we originally expected, and no one knows exactly whether it will ever fully recover again. Not all sands are equal then, and at least for marine flora and fauna, it matters whether there is silt or sand on the seafloor. 
considering this impact on nature, is it still acceptable to pump sand onto Zotz beaches? We put the question to the regional authorities in charge of coastal protection in Husum. LKN Director Birgit Matelski is familiar with the studies. Of course, sand removal has consequences. No one is ignoring that. Rather, we keep an eye on it and we get permissions. And we have measures to counterbalance its effects. But what would the alternative be? Abandoning silt? Or building concrete structures? We believe that soft measures using sediment are the most sustainable ones. Are there really no other options? For us in the state of Schleswig-Holstein, this is the largest scale of sand pumping that takes place. But compared to what happens in other countries like Spain, the United States or the UK, it's just a seagull's dropping. And for that, no one is prepared to give up their beach, least of all on Zut. But there are other ways of protecting the coast, using levees or dikes, for example. Here in Ahrenshoop, over 40 kilometers northeast of Rostock, the University of Rostock researched just that. The seaside resort of Ahrenshoop lies on the narrow tongue of land that connects Germany's mainland with the Dars Peninsula. Discussions about how to best protect the beach have been held here for some time, as it's proving increasingly unable to withstand the impact of storm tides. The people of Ahrenshoop hope academics like Professor of Land Economics Jesko Hirschfeld can provide answers. What's the best kind of protection for this beach and for this sand? The coastal protection authorities have already done a lot here. They have installed an offshore wave breaker that absorbs most of the wave's energy. And they have added a lot of sand which protects the cliffs and the lower-lying coast in Ahrenshoop. It's a protection system, if you will, that's well designed. A cheaper option would be just to use levees, for example. How much cheaper would it be to build a big seawall? At least several hundred thousand euros less per year in terms of maintenance. But if it looks too industrial, or if there was too little beach in front of it, then visitors would stay away. And that would drive up the costs a lot on the other side. Hirschfeld has calculated that if fewer tourists came here, Ahrens Hope would lose up to 1 million euros in revenue. We asked people how long they would stay somewhere that looked like that, and both willingness to come and to stay significantly dropped. The environmental economist's research indicates that tourists would stay away if the sand was no longer there. So Ahrens Hope will keep on replacing the disappearing sand. While Germany spends millions of euros replenishing its beaches, sand is being stripped from the coastlines of other countries. Such as here, in the Cape Verde Islands, where men and women illegally remove sand from the Atlantic Ocean. A bucket of wet sand weighs 50 kilos. That's a lot to carry. But there's nothing left on the beach itself. This used to be a sandy beach. The rocks back there were not visible because everything was covered with sand. We removed all of it, until the rocks underneath became visible. Sand is illegally mined from the sea in large quantities in many other countries, like here in Cambodia. So-called sand mafias are active worldwide, as sand is a highly valuable commodity. But its removal has an impact. Coastal settlements are left vulnerable to flooding and are often abandoned. Every cartload of sand that is taken from beaches takes away a bit of coastal protection. Once the sand on the shore or riverbank has gone, like here by the Niger River in Mali, people dive to retrieve it. They risk their lives getting this valuable resource, which, according to the United Nations, is the world's most profitable illegal commodity. 
But illegal sand mining is rarely prosecuted, also because the world is hungry for sand. Big construction projects devour huge quantities. The demand for sand has tripled in the last 20 years, according to a UN study. In megacities like Dubai, huge developments are being constructed on artificial islands. The desert city imported most of the sand from Australia because sand from the desert is too fine for construction. Here, whole new districts are being created in the sea, built on sand taken from our seas and oceans. The world consumes roughly 40 to 50 billion tons of sand a year, more than the Earth can replace. The sand business is booming in Germany, too. In the country's construction industry alone, the turnover was 3.6 billion euros last year. But it takes centuries for nature to create sand. The complex process starts in the mountains. After rock falls, rocks and stones end up in riverbeds, where they're slowly worn down and transported to the sea. But these days, only a small proportion of that sand ends up at the coast, largely because of dams. Legal and illegal sand mining also means that less and less of it actually reaches our coastlines. Unlike in Dubai, Germany can use its own sand, but these resources are also finite. Because more and more sand pits are exhausted, new ones have to be created. That has an environmental price and is a cause of controversy in many places. There has been a sand pit for decades on the outskirts of Osterholz, near the northern German city of Bremen. Now, the pit is due to be extended right into the middle of a landscape conservation area. Environmentalists like biologist Jutta Kemma are trying to stop the expansion. Here you can see how far we are into the landscape conservation area. The yellow line, which delineates this entire area, that's the border of the conservation area. So we are slap bang in the middle of an area that is specifically meant to protect what the landscape looks like. The area in question is almost as big as 20 soccer fields. The plan is to extend the pit by 14 hectares a plan that's been approved by the municipality of Osterholz. This is the area. This used to be woodland, like it still is all around. I think these trees were felled this year. The sand pit operator has to plant new trees to offset this loss, but Jutta Kemma and other environmentalists aren't satisfied with that. Sitting in a chopped down forest feels intense. Yes, I agree. And I wonder why sand has to be mined from precisely this area of woodland. Lower Saxony is one of the German states with the fewest woodland areas. We should be taking care of our woods and developing them, and not sacrificing them to extract raw materials. The authorities in Osterholz have confirmed that parts of the new sand pit are located in a landscape conservation area. They say that was taken into account in the approval process. And they say that the tree plantings compensate for that. Operations manager Andreas Albrecht agrees. He had to plant new trees even before felling any existing ones. We do have to fell trees to get at the material. But on the other hand, we've also created new areas which can be used for farming or for planting woodland. As part of the planning procedure, we have to show that we have offset areas where trees are being planted, although we won't be felling trees in the new extraction area for another 15 years. 
How do you feel when someone like me or environmentalists come and ask, why are you cutting down trees to extract sand? I don't want to accuse anyone of being hypocritical, but I think it's definitely problematic. Nature conservationists, environmentalists, want to be able to drive along roads as well. They want to live in a house which is made of these materials. And therefore, I don't think that you can just reject it and say, not in my backyard. It should just be there. We are forced to encroach on nature to obtain these raw materials. Andreas Albrecht is right to say that we all need sand. It is even used to make cars. Our entire modern lives are literally built on sand. Sand is the least appreciated commodity today because so many things we use every day contain sand. A detached house contains up to 200 tons of sand. It's in toothpaste, glasses, smartphones, microchips, in jeans, and of course, in highways, in bridges, and much, much more. Researchers around the world are trying to find an alternative to sand. Because one thing is clear, if the global demand for sand remains at this level, even countries like Germany will need good ideas. Professor Andrea Kustemann from the University of Applied Sciences in Munich is working on one of these ideas. Her alternative to sand involves recycling old concrete. So this is the typical recycled aggregate with old aggregate and cement round about it. It's very good for producing concrete. Even high-grade products can be made from it. The problem is that there is not much demand for recycled concrete so far. If it's possible to create 100% recycled concrete, why isn't that happening much more in Germany? It's new and up until now gravel was cheaper. We live in the promised land where glaciers brought a lot of gravel and previously that was a lot cheaper. Now the recycled aggregate is approaching the same price and so it is attracting more interest. The dream is to reduce the cement content and to make eco-concrete, where the recycled aggregate contains little cement and so its carbon footprint is much lower. Up till now, recycled concrete has barely been used in Germany. And so long as it's possible to mine sand, even in landscape conservation areas, using natural resources will remain cheaper. But in Germany too, Sand is not endlessly available. Sand mining comes at a price. And sandy beaches also aren't free. If we want to have both in the future, great beaches and enough sand, we will have to soon embrace alternatives. <laughs>